Uh, I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Kate Henry, who's going to talk today. Um, she's very kindly agreed to speak to us from the UK, so it's much later there. But um, Kate is, uh, she's a, well, she sort of spans from modern biogeochemistry all the way through to the paleo record. Um, she did her undergraduate at Cambridge, actually, two years before me. And she crossed to the other place, which is what we call Oxford in the UK, and did a PhD at Oxford with Ros Rickaby and Gideon Henderson. And she's also done postdocs at Huey uh, and lectureship at Cardiff. And she's now a, a reader and a Royal Society Research Fellow in Geochemistry at uh, Bristol. And so for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with England's perhaps more antiquated scheme, that's kind of associate professor on our scale. So she's been incredibly productive. She has about 70 publications. She's worked in the Antarctic and the Arctic. Her sort of main focus is looking at sort of biogenic opal and silicon isotopes. And she's sort of one of her main projects right now is looking at sort of biogeochemistry and cycling in the Labrador Sea um, in the Arctic. And that's something that sort of we've been collaborating on iron with uh, via John Hawkins. So, yeah, welcome if you want to start. Thank you. Oh, that's really great. And um, yeah, I, I was promised that if I did a talk at 8.30 in the evening on a Friday, I could drink beer. So I do have a beer. So cheers. Thank you. Um, so this, this this is quite late for me. And um, so hopefully this will still make sense. Um, but thank you very much for inviting me. It's, um, it's really great to be here. So hopefully this will work. Um, I think that's what I want to do. So I'm just going to carry on assuming you can see this all okay. Do let me know if there's any problems. We can see it. It's fine. Awesome. Great. Okay. So yes, I'm going to talk about um, the project that Tim was talking about. Um, so Arctic and subarctic silicon cycling. And I'm just going to start off with this animation. And this is a really beautiful um, um, animation that NASA produced, uh, I guess, a couple of years ago now. And it's just showing... Um, uh, day by day, the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And um, it's really just a pretty excuse for me to start talking about um, carbon dioxide. Um, of course, we're all very concerned about what our, um, over longer timescales than this animation, we're worried about um, what our increasing um, uh, outgassing of CO2 to the atmosphere is going to do to global climate. And um, the, the Earth is warming up, and some places are warming up more than others. And in particular, the high latitudes are um, really climatically sensitive. And the Arctic and parts of the Antarctic are experiencing some of the, the fastest warming that we've seen in recent decades. And, um, you know, as well as being climatically sensitive, there are also some, some really important feedbacks that are sort of centred on the, on the poles and the high latitudes that we really want to understand if we're going to try and figure out the impacts that um, climate might have on um, these processes and how those might feed back on carbon cycling and climate into the future. So I'm just illustrating this with um, another beautiful animation. This is the ice flow um, of the Antarctic ice sheet. And you can see in those um, purple colours where the ice is flowing um, ever increasing speeds. And um, it's sort of understanding what these sorts of processes might, might do to um, the carbon cycle that um, is, is where I'm going to start this talk. So. Um, I guess where, do, where I'm going to go with this is thinking about what the links are between glacial weathering and um, atmospheric CO2. And, um, you know, I suppose for decades we've known about the um, uh, potential feedbacks between uh, silicate weathering and CO2 um, that might be going on un underneath ice sheets. Um, so um, that's what you can see over here. Um, if you increase um, glaciation, uh, you could increase silicate weathering. And that actually draws down CO2, uh, resulting in, in a potentially positive feedback. There are other things going on too, so you can have oxidative weathering and, um, for example, sulfide oxidation. And this does the opposite, it actually releases um, CO2. So you can add as a, as a negative feedback um, on glaciation. And you can kind of reverse that if you're thinking about deglaciation and, and, um, um, and warming. But there is something else as well that I'm going to be spending the rest of the talk um, focusing on, um, which is this one down here. And that's the fact that we, we now sort of understand that there's actually lots biologically active going on in and around glacial systems. In particular, that physical and chemical weathering releases really important nutrients that can then impact downstream productivity um, and, and um, impact how carbon is sequestered through um, organic matter formation. So um, I'm actually now gonna zip up to the Arctic, as you might expect from my talk. And um, this is just um, 
really nice video from some of my colleagues at the Bristol Glaciology Centre um, from a site in West Greenland. And um, I just like showing this video because it really illustrates what glacial meltwater um, outwash looks like. Um, the dye that's being put in there is there to measure the flux of water. And you can see there's just a lot of water. I think that's really the main message of that. There's a lot of water. And um, you'll also see that it's really cloudy. And that's because it's full of um, suspended particulate matter. And so all of that water has a load of these different uh, important elements in there. There's dissolved iron, there are particular iron phases, there are phosphorus phases. Um, and in, what I'm particularly interested in are um, the silicon phases that are there. So uh, why do I care about the silicon cycle? Um, well, it's mainly because of these guys here. So um, as well as the silicon cycle being um, linked to climate through long-term um, weathering of silicate rocks, it's also linked via productivity. So um, these guys here, diatoms, are photosynthetic algae. They make their shells from silica. Um, so they need silicon to grow. And they're responsible for like nearly half of the export production in the oceans. So they're really critical for carbon cycling. And when those um, cells die, they sink, some of it will dissolve back into the water, but some will get buried and, and sequester that organic carbon that's within the cells uh, within them. Um, they're also really important for ecosystems, so they're the basis of lots of marine e um, food chains. And there are other silicious organisms like, uh, here are some um, sponge spicules, these little skeletal elements you find on uh, in deep sea sponges. And those sponges can perform really important ecosystem services too. So um, they perform habitat services, they filter water, so they're important for water quality. Um, and you know, increasingly we're realizing that they've got some really neat chemicals in them that can be used for pharmaceuticals. So we really care about how and why silicon moves around. If we're thinking about the Arctic in particular, then there's an extra reason, um, which is that there's ever more evidence coming out that um, large regions of the Arctic are at least seasonally um, limited um, in terms of silicon. So that the primary production by the diatoms is actually um, limited by, by the silicon itself. Um, so this has been shown recently um, by Karina Geisbrecht, um, who did, finished her PhD uh, a couple of years ago now in the Canadian Arctic. And some nice work by um, Jeffrey Krauss and others um, in the North Atlantic and off Greenland. Here's just a little plot of a couple of um, incubation experiments that they did um, down here off West Greenland, same sort of location. And it just roughly quick, quickly to, to explain the punchline here basically shows that if you add silicon to a control sample, you can actually increase the, the mass of biogenic silica that's accumulated. So in other words, that's very indica indicative that silicon is, is limiting. So that's the Arctic. Cool. OK, so um, the way I sort of think about it is that we have this system where we know that there's subglacial weathering that releases nutrients. And um, so we need to understand these subglacial processes, what's releasing them, what are the chemical reactions, so how might they then be sensitive to deglaciation? And um, I'm going to talk a bit about how we can use stable isotopes to do that. But ultimately, what we want to do is get those nutrients downstream to the ecosystems that might then use them and help to sequester carbon. But the only sort of complication in all of this is that sub, well, subglacial weathering rarely releases this meltwater directly into the ocean. Often it goes through more complicated systems, proglacial systems, different types of fields, and all of these have their own internal cycling um, systems that can um, basically make the whole thing a lot more complicated. They're really heterogeneous, and there's lots of different processes that go on um, that could control how these nutrients flow downstream. So um, the project that um, I've been leading over the last few years, we have gone into the fields, and I'll show you a little bit about the work that we've been doing there. But also we've been looking at the coastal regions themselves. And it's because we can use these coastal regions to actually sort of integrate all these processes over space and time and, and actually trace those meltwaters out to the ocean and see what the um, impacts are. OK, so silicon isotopes and glacial weathering. So um, I've already mentioned silicon isotopes, so I'll just um, do a quick silicon isotope 101. Um, and um, there are three stable isotopes of silicon that you can see here. So 28, 29 and 30. Most of it's silicon 28 with a little bit from 29 and 30. And just like any stable isotope system, <clears throat> we talk about variations in this sort of delta notation. So the ratio in this case of 30 to 28 in a sample relative to a standard. And just like we use other stable isotope systems, the idea here is that these different physical, chemical and biological reactions result in different fractionations. Um, and that's what you can see here in this little summary plot. So these sort of biological materials, um, minerals and precipitation reactions and dissolution. So 
it's another control on the system that we can use to try and understand the mechanisms that are um, going on. Okay, so um, let's just jump into some um, uh, stuff from Greenland. So this is some really nice work from John Hawkins and Jade Hatton, um, who I've worked with um, in my group. And this is a, a seasonal signal of um, silicon isotopes from two different glacial systems in um, West Greenland. And um, the, the silicon isotopes down here are the, really the ones to look at. And in each plot, the solid symbols are the dissolved silicon, and in the uh, hollow symbols, that's the um, a, a solid on amorphous phase that we found. It's basically this sort of slightly strange weathering product that we've discovered in um, um, glacial um, meltwaters. And you can see that throughout the season, these trend towards the dissolved um, isotopes trend towards lighter um, signals, and that amorphous phase is also um, much lighter than the bedrock that you can see in those solid um, horizontal bars. The um, blue vertical bars are outwash events. They're basically when outburst events, if you like, where there's suddenly a, an increase in um, meltwater release. And that's really where you start seeing these light isotopes coming along. So this was basically, this was the first hints that we had that there was something quite interesting going on in terms of silicon cycling under glaciers. And it was really tied to this release of very light, isotopically light silicon. And we noticed this seasonal progression, and we thought that maybe this could be because whatever's going on underneath um, the glaciers that's causing this light isotopic signal is sort of built up over a season. And it's only really here in the late season where you have these outburst events, where all these previously isolated water pockets are basically drained, and they can actually then um, be released into the proglacial outlet. So we built up this hypothesis and we've been doing various experiments with um, crushed glacial material to try and understand these processes more. And it, um, we also then um, took a sort of panarctic view to see if we could find it elsewhere. And indeed, basically, wherever you look, you find that glacial um, river waters are isotopically light. And where we had access to this amorphous silica material, we found very consistent um, signals in there as well. And here you can just see a sort of summary of all of that. So these glacial rivers um, really do have a, a much um, and a significantly lighter signal than the non-glacial rivers put together. Um, we didn't really find a huge amount of patterns in all of this, unfortunately, when we took this panarctic view, probably because there's a mixture of lithologies and various other things. So we did find some links with um, uh, the size of the catchment um, and um, and the amount of this amorphous material in the in the rivers. But otherwise, it was quite a complicated story. Anyway, so we've built up this idea through these experiments and observations that it's to do with both the physical crushing of um, rocks underneath glaciers and a sort of cyclic um, series of chemical reactions, so sort of hydrolysis precipitation reactions that drive this very light isotopic signal. And, um, you know, I found this all very fascinating. We could actually look at this stuff. So we looked under um, TEM and found, you know, we could actually see this sort of fluffy amorphous stuff that was sticking to the outside layers of more um, uh, crystalline minerals. And um, from my point of view, the most interesting thing was when we actually just did a very simple incubation experiment with this stuff, we took some um, glacial sediment, half of it we basically treated with um, alkaline to remove any of this amorphous silica, and half we didn't. And we then put it in very low silicon seawater. And we found that the untreated um, uh, material released silicon at really quite um, um, an impressive rate, such that the, probably the whole lot would be dissolved in about a year. So for me, this was really critical because we saw that there was this reactive phase that was being created underneath glaciers by crushing and chemical reactions that could potentially be a source of um, dissolved silicon to the ocean once it hits higher salinity waters. So that was really exciting. So, so what about this impact on downstream biochemistry? Can we actually um, see this happening? So this is really where my, um, my project sort of stepped in. So um, this is sort of a summary map of really where we went and the sort of the, the focus of um, the project that you can see um, down here was to really try and throw everything that we could at the question of um, silicon cycling in this sort of um, part of the world. And um, the map here you can see is a cruise track um, from 2017 um, when um, uh, I, I led the, the major um, expedition um, for this project. Uh, all the different dots are different stations where we um, threw a, a toy over the side of the ship. Um, and this is a sort of nice summary cartoon I'll keep coming back to, just sort of showing the different types of, of equipment that we had available to us to try and address this, this question. Um, but first of all, um, I'm actually going to skip forward uh, to 2018 and 2019, where we went into the fields. So I slightly did this in a slightly reverse order, but that was the way things worked out. 
Um, and this is where we went. So we looked at two different field systems um, near Nuuk. So you can't see it very clearly, sorry, but the, but the capital of Greenland is, is here, near Nuuk. And we looked at Gotthabs Fjord and Amaralik Fjord. And essentially, they're two contrasting field systems. Amaralik Fjord is a land terminating glacial system. Godhabs Fjord is essentially a marine terminating glacier. There's the glacier here, lots of lots of bergs. But there are some, it's a bit complicated because there are some smaller um, glacial, um, uh, pro-glacial systems in here as well. So it's not a totally clean system, but it's as good as we could get. And here's the team uh, looking relatively smiley. Um, so this is what it sort of looked like out in the fields, very characteristic um, summer in Greenland of very low cloud um, and lots of bergs. Um, we used this, um, um, chartered um, boat uh, from a couple who live in Nuuk, who were incredibly helpful and amazingly patient with um, us crazy scientists. Um, but we sampled water, we used a trace metal clean towfish that you can see just being deployed there. We had Niskin bottles, um, we, we did quite a lot of um, different things. Um, and here's just a few sort of nice prettier pictures. Here's the Keysack, the boat we used, um, some nice field pictures. But um, let's let's sort of delve into the into the fields now. So the different the main difference why we're looking at these two different systems is that land terminating and marine terminating glacial fields sort of do behave quite differently. Um, so the land terminating glacier that you can see the data for here tends to be characterized by um, say this is distance away from the glacier these really high turbid waters right up um, against the um, where the glacial water reaches into the fjord, and then it sort of the stuff settles out quite quickly. Um, you tend to have um, uh, relatively shallow, medium levels of chlorophyll um, within the fields. And if you then contrast that to Godhab's field, which is this marine terminating field, you tend to have um, much deeper layers of turbidity because you have these sort of subglacial plumes that form and sort of um, upwell and, and bring up the sort of the particulates from the um, glacial erosion. Um, and they also bring up some nutrients as well as the glacial input bring, providing nutrients. So you tend to have this sort of um, relatively deep and much stronger chlorophyll maximum in these fields. So that's the sort of context of what we're dealing with. But, you know, you know me, I'm um, kind of interested in the silicon side of things. So um, what does that look like? So this is just now a depth profile uh, on the vertical axis, just against the concentration of dissolved silicon in the water. And um, the two different field systems are in the different um, symbols, but essentially they're showing quite similar profiles actually. Um, and they, you, can, you can see those really low salinity samples from near the glacier, really high in silicon and much, much higher than any of the marine sources. So you can see a sort of fairly typical marine source down here. A lot of it's coming from the glaciers. But as you move towards the um, um, more distal end of the field, you can see those silicon concentrations really being drawn down to next to nothing. So that's basically because there are there are diatoms growing in this field and they're using the silicon. But uh, we didn't just look at the dissolved fraction, we also looked at the particulates. And we looked at this amorphous silica. Now, something you have to keep in mind, which I'll come back to, is this, is, this amorphous silica is, um, is not going to be just this weathering product at this stage, it's also going to be the diatoms. Unfortunately, they're made of quite similar amorphous silica, so they will be extracted by the same procedures that we use. So you can kind of think of this as a mixture of all the reactive silica in the water. And you can compare the two different fields, you can see straight away that the land terminating field has a lot more silica. Uh, a lot of it is in this amorphous particulate phase, and I'm actually going to now make those two axes the same, just so you can see the difference there. So a lot more of this amorphous silica available. As you move down the field, a lot of it settles out, um, but a lot of it will still be in the form of diatoms. Um, and you know, we think this is going to actually play quite an important role in, in the whole silicon dynamics of the field. Um, we're just getting silicon isotope data for the field at the moment, so I don't yet have that to show you, but um, um, the Preliminary data that we have so far shows that there could be an interesting story there too. So this is what it looked like, and this is the back of um, the ship, the, the, the boat, <laughs> the boat that we used in 2018. Unfortunately, in 2019, I couldn't go, so I sent my team, and they had a much fancier boat. They had an actual container lab to do stuff in. Um, they had a lot more equipment, and they got to see the Northern Lights. So you know, just goes to show you shouldn't actually, you know, just um, uh, all the good stuff happens when you're not there. But it was a really successful trip and I'm, and I'm really pleased. And one of the extra bits of kit that we had during the expedition in 2019 um, was this. So this is Alex Beaton from the University of Southampton. And hiding behind there is um, uh, Lawrence Meir, who's actually at the Greenland Institute. 
Um, and this is, um, is a silicon sensor, actually it's a, it's a silicate and a nitrate sensor. So we deployed this in a very strong frame um, for the entire summer. And um, this hasn't been totally worked up yet, so that's why the axes aren't there, but just to show you what a season of dissolved silicon looks like, and you can see there's quite nice consistent patterns here, um, and the, you get these really nice big spikes, and this is all around at the time of the peak melting season. So we can actually see this really nice high resolution change in um, dissolved silicon um, in, in these fields. Okay, so that's the field stuff. So let's move on to the coastal oceans. So um, this is now the main expedition and we sort of did the coastal regions really. And I'm gonna really focus mostly on what's going on in this purple box. Here's the team, amazingly still looking smiley. Okay, so um, one of the toys we had available to us um, were a couple of ocean gliders. So that's these are these um, sort of torpedo shaped things here. And um, we deployed these for about nine days and they swam up and down the um, continental shelf break. And on board, they had a whole load of physical sensors, but also bio-optical sensors. And we were using these to really try and trace those um, meltwaters and in particular, the, the particulate material within them. So this is um, where we deployed it. And uh, you can see uh, the ship bathymetry there. Um, I'm just gonna show you one of the gliders. They actually both work really nicely. So we have um, comparable data from the two. Um, and I'm just going to give you the punchline now, um, and that is essentially that with using the glider data together with some of the shipboard data, we're really able to show that these meltwaters and these um, particles are these glacially um, particles of glacial origin are not just um, you know getting out into the ocean, but they're crossing into the boundary currents, and that's really important because that means they're being distributed into the Labrador Sea. So here are just some sections, just for anyone who wants to see some physical oceanography. So these are sections going, oh, I'll just go back briefly. These are sec these um, sections here, section one, section two, section three. So sort of, as it were, offshore. So you can see those nice, um, really nice plumes of meltwater in the low temperature and um, uh, low salinity waters. Um, these are just and there are three different sections there. And here are the bio-optics data. So if you can think in your mind about where those meltwaters were, you can see that you can pick up, this is the fluorescing dissolved organic matter that we think is either coming from the glaciers directly or from the fields. And you can see that those meltwaters basically light up with fluorescing dissolved organic matter, which is really exciting. Um, this is the chlorophyll. Um, um, you can see it's very limited to the surface layers, very strong stratification, very um, low light um, penetration in these waters. And here is the backscatter, which is a mixture, we think, of the chlorophyll right at the surface, but also we can see some of the signal from what looks very much like the glacial particles as well. So that's a really nice high resolution data showing that the stuff is really coming off um, these glacial fields. And just to sort of hammer the message home a bit more, um, this is the fluorescing dissolved organic matter again, the same plots I showed before, but superimposed now in those contours are the geostrophic velocity. So this is basically the currents. So these really strong um, jets that you get in the, um, the West Greenland current and probably some of the sort of eddies or sort of topographical steerings of this current are, um, well, basically the fluorescing um, organic matter is bang on top of where we get these currents. And we can play the same game with the backscatter as well. So this stuff is really gonna be not trapped by that boundary current, but is getting into it and crossing it, which is really important. So uh, the shipboard data, we had similar um, sort of um, in, in a way similar data. Um, so here's a nice um, ship transit that we did um, through one of these sort of glacially carved uh, troughs. And um, the shipboard LADCP, the lowered um, current profiler data basically shows the same thing. So here we have temperature and salinity again across this transect. And here's that geostrophic velocity. And you can see these really strong boundary currents here. Really strong baroclinicity, so pretty unstable pretty likely to be generating a lot of um, eddy activity. So what is being moved around? I mean, I talked about these particles, but we can actually also use um, geochemistry to look at the um, actual water. And here we've used an approach from um, uh, that um, um, Mike Meredith and others have used, um, which is deconvolving um, fresh water inputs. So the fresh water from meteoric water and sea ice using salinity and oxygen isotopes. So I've just put these sort of simultaneous equations up there, but we solved those um, using um, oxygen isotopes and salinity. And um, for the same transit, you can see here the meteoric water. And 
some of these values are pretty high. We're seeing up to 5% um, meteoric water in these um, you know, waters that are getting off, off the shelf, which is, is actually a significant amount, much more so than any sea ice melt. OK, so what does this mean for, for silicon? Let's go back to the nutrients. So um, this is the same transect uh, in this trough. And here I've shown now the, the nutrients. So um, nitrite, um, total inorganic nitrogen, silicic acid and um, uh, phosphate. And um, what you can see, which is you know somewhat contrary to any sort of hypothesis that these glaciers are supplying nutrients, is that those meltwater rich surface layers are really, really low in nutrients, in dissolved nutrients. So if you take silicic acid, you can see really very low values here, potentially limiting values, but also incredibly low nitrate as well. Um, What's really striking, though, is when you look at this a little bit more, is these slight differences in um, the silicon profile compared to the to the nitrate. And um, we can use this term silicon star, which I'm going to come back to, which is essentially just the difference between the silicon um, concentration and the nitrate. And um, you can see these really high um, silicon star waters here um, coming off um, the shelf. And um, I'm going to come back to this. This is consistent with what we've seen in other things, too, and I'll, I will come back to it. And I think this is all an important part of the picture. And um, so what about the particulates? So um, we can measure the amorphous silica again, and we've done that. Um, of course, it's going to be a mixture of stuff. It's going to be biogenic and glacial. And we see an inverse relationship. So we see these very low dissolved silicon waters um, actually have a load of amorphous silica in the surface. And a lot of that is going to be diatom. Um, but there's going to be quite a lot of glacial particulates as well. So it's quite hard to say, you know, we can see that there's trends with both salinity and with chlorophyll. So it's really quite, unfortunately, a bit challenging to actually say um, what's going on there. We will, we haven't yet, but we will have some isotope work, which will hopefully shed some light on that. But we can actually just take a direct look at what the diatoms are doing. So we were very lucky to have on board um, uh, Rebecca Pickering from Jeff Krause's lab. And she did some um, silicon 32 uptake experiments on board. So she took some seawater, she spiked it with um, a radioactive um, isotope of silicon, silicon 32, um, left it for 24 hours and then filtered it and then measured the radioactivity um, after equilibration uh, and basically showed how much biogenic silica had been produced. And here are the results that you can see here. The bottom line of all of this is that despite the fact that it's really cold, despite the fact that there's basically no silicon, these diatoms are really very active indeed and highly productive. Um, you know, they're basically the same sort of levels that you get in um, in blooms in the open ocean. So um, uh, in the, in the um, mid and um, mid latitudes, for example. So kind of surprisingly active diatoms. So I'm going to return now to that sort of that hint I gave earlier about silicon star and some sort of um, bottom water signal going on. And um, we think basically that those um, that the, the sediments are playing a really key role here in, in modifying those waters. So on board, we um, we took lots of sediment cores. Um, we took um, pore water profiles that you can see here. So we used rhizons to essentially suck out the juice from cores. Uh, looks like some sort of horrible medical experiment, um, but it's a nice clean way of getting um, pore waters out. Uh, and we did core incubation. So that's what this contraption is here. So you take a core with some water on top of it. And you use this contraption to basically sample it over um, a day or two. And you can just actively observe, as, as it were, what is coming out of, of the sediment over that sort of time scale. So just to show you, and this is work, I should say, which has been done by a really great postdoc in my group, um, Hong Chin Ng. Um, and here are some of his results. So these are the pore water data for um, the two cores near Nuuk. Um, the pore water dissolved silicon does very sort of your typical um, increases with depth, reaching an asymptotic maximum. And um, the poor waters, I'll just sort of guide your eye here. You can see that in both cases, especially in, in um, the closest core, you get this sort of quite um, rapid um, trend towards lighter isotopes with depth and this sort of gradual uh, trend towards lighter isotopes. There's a bit of a kickback here in this core, which um, I won't talk about now, but I can talk about later. So lighter isotopes. Here are the core incubation um, results. This is actually for every, all the incubations we did on the cruise. Again, those same colours, those two red colours are the ones that we're looking at here. Um, 
so you can see that through time, the concentration of silicon goes up, there's stuff coming out. And rather than trending towards lighter isotopes, like the Paul Waters suggest, in this case, there was a slight but systematic trend towards heavier isotopes. So something different going on. And um, oh, sorry, what, what we think is going on is that in the case of the Paul Waters, those lighter isotopes are going to be much more of a lithogenic signal, maybe sort of partly to do with these glacial particles, these glacial amorphous silica weathering products. Whereas in the um, core incubation, we think that this is actually recycling of biogenic opal, which will be much more isotopically heavy. And um, if you actually look at the rates of release, um, it's actually very comparable to the biological um, uptake of silicon. So we think there's this very tight coupling. It's produced by diatoms very um, uh, quickly in the surface waters. As soon as any silicon is available, it sinks and it dissolves very quickly at the core top um, sediment water interface. So very tight pelagic benthic coupling. OK, so this silicon star thing I said I'd come back to. And um, so I've compiled here um, um, a whole load of um, profiles of silicon star in, in the water column. So this is um, in those coloured symbols. Um, that's basically the same transect along this glacial trough that I showed you before. And the black stars are the data from the fields themselves. So you can see these here. These are the CTDs from um, the coastal waters and the fields. And you can see that um, if you look at all these data all together, you can see there's a really nice um, offshore onshore trend towards um, more positive um, silicon star, so an excess of dissolved silicon relative to nitrate. And um, what I think is um, quite clear is that that's sort of, you know, reaching a, a maximum within the fields. And um, I think really it's, a, it's got a lot to do with how these particulates and these glacial particulates are cycled in the fields. A lot of them um, will, will sink. Um, a lot of that dissolved silicon will be taken up by diatoms, which will also sink. And I think it's then what happens at, um, in the sediments that really drives this system. So what I've added here are um, some other pore water data um, and some core top data from within the fields themselves. So um, from the sediment cores that we took in the fields, you can see that those pore waters are incredibly enriched in silicon. And even the, the bottom water is, um, is really quite enriched in silicon relative to nitrate. And so I think that this is where you'll see the influence of glacial weathering on the open ocean, that it's actually cycling through sediments and the modification of bottom waters where some of the biggest um, impacts will be seen. So I threw a lot of information at you. So before moving on, I just wanted to sort of summarize it going back to this plot here. So we know that glacial weathering releases this um, amorphous silica. It also releases quite a lot of dissolved silica. This dissolved silica, either straight from the glacier or from dissolved material, feeds field diatoms. We know that. We've actually looked at the um, uh, environmental DNA in the fields, and we can see really strong diatom patterns. Um, and we think the isotopes also show that as well. We know this stuff reaches the ocean. We know that it crosses the boundary current and can actually get out into the open ocean as well. We can see what we think are glacial particles. These are very likely going to include amorphous silica, which will be continuously dissolving as, as they reach these more saline waters. The diatoms are incredibly productive in these coastal waters. Pretty much any silicon that's available to them, they'll be taking up. So it's really, I think, in this, uh, this pool of sinking particles where we can actually sort of start seeing this sort of chemical fingerprint of um, glacial silica in, in the water column. So all of these um, particles sink, the diatoms and the glacial particles, and um, as they're recycled in this sort of relatively shallow marine sediments, they can actually then release this dissolved silicon back, modifying the bottom waters, which will then recirculate back into the fields. Okay, so <clears throat> I did sort of promise in this talk that I was going to talk about the Arctic as well as the subarctic, and technically I've only really talked about the subarctic, so I am just going to talk relatively briefly about some other projects that that my lab are involved in. Um, and so one of them is um, this project, the Changing Arctic Ocean Seafloor, the aptly named Chaos Project. And this is um, uh, part of a very um, broad program of um, uh, research um, in, in the Arctic in the UK. Our project, Chaos, is really focused in on the Barents Sea. And the idea of the whole project is really to understand the seafloor, the Arctic seafloor. So understanding from my point of view, nutrient cycling and the role of the seafloor in nutrient cycling, 
but also we have biologists on board um, who are understanding the benthic ecosystems and how they play a role in carbon sequestration. Um, so what my lab's interested in this um, expedition, uh, in this project, um, was that we, we collected samples on, on three expeditions um, in three consecutive years, and we collected samples for more silicon and silicon isotopes um, from pore waters. And we did one year of core incubations as well. And as well as just doing the measurements, um, we've also been teaming up with a modeler, um, Sandra Arndt, who's now in Brussels. And um, she specializes in reaction um, transport models. And um, we've actually built a silicon specific one. And it's really to try and understand these different processes that you can see here that go on in, in the, um, in the uh, shallow sediments and how that might um, um, impact fluxes of nutrients of, like silicon into the water. And the beauty of these models is that even though we have a lot of observational data, all we can really do with pore water data is assume um, diffusion. It doesn't take into any consideration anything like um, a direction or biotubation or anything like that. We can get a bit more of an idea from core incubations, but they're still not perfect. Um, they still don't really um, account for um, advection. They probably don't do a great job in dealing with things like biotubation. So we can actually use models to start to pull apart some of these different processes and figure out how important they are. Um, and Lastly, the other sort of point of this project is, is really to look to the future. We, we did a transit um, from north to south in the Barents Sea. And the idea is that we're getting a lot of um, very rapid sea ice decline in the area. So can we compare the sort of northern and southern stations to see what the future might look like for those more northern sites? Um, it, as and when, if and when the sea ice retreats entirely. So I'm just going to leave that there. I won't go into too much detail about that right now. Um, I will, will let my PhD student who's working on this present it um, at some conference at some point, hopefully. Um, but it's a really, really neat project and some really exciting um, things to come out of it. So the other thing that we're finding is the case in these high latitude re regions is, um, is that there's just a whole lot more going on in terms of sedimentary silicon cycling that we knew about. And some of this sort of understanding has come from some really nice work that um, my lab did again with um, Rebecca Pickering and Jeff Krauss. And what we were doing was using sequential extractions um, to try and find these different sort of pools of silicon in, in sediments. So we've been measuring for, for years and, and years and years um, biogenic silica in sediments using a weak alkaline leach. Um, but it's only much more recently we're realizing that there's a whole lot more going on. So we could use, um, to start with, a weak acid leach to remove um, silicon that had been adsorbed to what we, we think they were adsorbed to, to metal oxides, sort of iron oxyhydroxides or manganese oxides, things like that. And we found that there was a really quite considerable amount of silicon that is, um, is, a, is absorbed in that way. It's quite an important pool of silicon. So these are some results um, that Rebecca produced. These are actually um, Gulf of um, Mexico sediments. And uh, you can see that this, this uh, weak acid leach and these yellow symbols here is really, uh, sorry, these are the cores, the depth of the cores plotted against the isotopes. And those weak alkaline, uh, sorry, weak acid leach samples are really isotopically light compared to everything else. So we have um, in the um, pink is a sort of basically a lithogenic signal, very much as we'd expect, somewhere between sort of minus half and zero. And um, the turquoise and the black are essentially two different ways of looking at biogenic silica. I, I won't go into the details there but fairly consistent and very much a biogenic silica signal, quite heavy. Um, so this is really cool. This is stuff that we got from the Gulf of Mexico. But what we've been finding is that this seems to be the case in the high latitudes as well. So um, these um, adsorbed silicon pools and these sort of potentially sort of orthogenic minerals that we're, we're teasing apart with isotopes um, are forming not only in um, sort of tropical or um, mid latitude regions, but in the high latitudes as well. So it does seem to be a fairly ubiquitous process. OK, so I've whizzed through that quite quickly. I think I'm clearly uh, tired at the end of the week, so um, I will. But I will leave it there. And um, just to sort of summarize the sort of messages, I suppose. We found um, in the past few years that glaciers release a lot of a lot of silicon and they don't just release a lot of dissolved silicon, but this amorphous um, silica weathering product. And this, this ASI reacts with seawater, it dissolves relatively quickly and it releases um, 
dissolved silicon, which is biologically available. It's a key nutrient and it's really important in the Arctic because it could be limiting in some um, times of the year. We could trace these glacial particles offshore. We know they get offshore um, either in the form of, AS, of this ASI or in diatoms from the fields, and they reach into this high energy boundary system. So then we know that we could, that they will cross the boundary currents, they can get into the, they can probably get swept up in eddies and transported offshore. And what we've also found is that there's this really strong um, benthic pelagic coupling in these coastal regions. So you have this incredibly rapid cycling through biology from these incredibly well adapted diatom communities. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I was going to say. I will just finish off with um, the usual sort of thanks. Um, firstly, that all of this work was nothing to do with me. Basically, it was all done by amazing early career researchers, um, all of whom I, I thank a lot. Um, and also, of course, with any of these sorts of um, uh, uh, fieldwork expeditions, there's a huge number of other people who basically make this whole thing possible. So thank you to them as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Hopefully you're, you're all still there. Okay, thanks very much. That was great. And I think you covered a lot of um, different disciplines a lot of people here work on, so it was great. Um, okay, we're going to throw it open to questions. What we normally do is ask students to go first. So if you want to raise your hand, I'll coordinate. Do we have any student questions? Come on, guys. Must be, uh, must be some burning questions. Okay. Well, if not, I'll open it to anyone to ask a question. Assuming people can hear me. Oh, uh, yes, Jen. Hi, Kate. Thanks so much for that. Was an awesome presentation. I just had a quick question. Um, I I might have missed you mentioning this. Um, as you're looking at seasonality of um, you know the silicate and and uh, changes in dynamics and behavior season seasonally have how many is this a trip that has ultimately just started it, how long has this been going and um you know it, it seasonality wise um have you noticed anything uh particular particularly different than you had originally thought something that stuck out sure okay so um I mean, I suppose we were limited by logistics to a, to a huge extent when it came to actually looking, you know, it would be beautiful to have, to have year round information here. Right. Um, the one thing that we could do was um, we had um, in 2019, we sort of had two sort of mini expeditions. Actually, I didn't go into so much detail, but it meant that at the beginning of um, uh, the year, it was sort of May time, I think we were able to go out and do initial sampling. We deployed those sensors, sensors, so they were out for the entire summer, and then we collected them in September. Um, so we did get an entire summer, and it really was an entire melt season because in May, I think it was, when we went out originally, we were battling against ice. You know, it was really I, like when ice was beginning to open up. And then um, by September, we had northern nights. So, um, and I, that silicon um, sensor data I showed you, like really captured the, the peak of the melt season. So, I mean, that's really what's going to be driving a lot of the seasonality is um, in the fields anyway. Right. Um, so we did manage to capture that. Um, in terms of things that surprised me, um, I, mean, I think that just the, I, I really was surprised by how those diatoms behaved in those surface waters. It was really quite extraordinary. I there's there's, there's no silicon. <laughs> what are they doing? Why are they there? How are they there? Um, yeah, so yeah. Don't really surprise me. That was yeah, definitely. It. Yeah, I I would definitely be uh, interested in learning more about that and that behavior for sure. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Amy Levanta. 
Hi, Kate, that was really fantastic. Super interesting. And my question feeds off of the one that you just answered um, with regard to these diatom blooms. Were there certain species that rose above the others as far as taking advantage of that extra silica? Um, oh my goodness me, uh, now my mind's gone blank and I knew that you were going to ask me and I now my mind's gone blank as to what they were. But we did, um, like I say, we didn't do... Um, we didn't do cell counts, but we used eDNA, and that's how we got at the populations. Um, and so the interesting thing was that we found it was really heterogeneous. The two different field systems had two very different populations. Um, and I want to say that there was certainly Catoceros was one of the fields that uh, definitely had them. And I can't remember the other one. Um, but it was these sort of, um, I, from my point of view, sort of quite classic sort of opportunistic little guys. Thank you. Okay, I think Nancy has her hand up. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Nancy Williams. Great talk. Um, so I, I think a lot about the Southern Ocean and I look at it from the perspective of um, biogeochemical Argo float data most of the time. So we're, we're measuring nitrate, but we can't measure silicate. Um, and so I was trying to think, you know, is, is is the same thing happening down there or is it a completely different process because um i noticed that you're nitrate limited it sounds like in the in the um or near greenland um and of course nitrate limitation isn't an issue so can you kind of compare and contrast those two systems yeah um so we have we do have some similar data from the West Antarctic Peninsula is in, you know, we've used silicon isotopes to look at pore waters and core incubation um, data. And um, the entire system is very, so it's basically swamped by biogenic opal. So all of the sedimentary processes are um, driven by biogenic opal dissolution. It's fairly, it's really very clear in the isotopes. And we think there might be some of this sort of orthogenic mineral formation going on, but it's, um, quite hard to see um, between all the biogenic opal dissolution, basically. And I and we'd have some evidence that this flux of um, silicon out of the sediments is modifying bottom water um, off the Antarctic Peninsula, but it's sort of adding silicon to lots of silicon. So the impact of that, I, I don't know. I think we should, I think it's really important to try and figure out. It might be that you're changing the balance of silicon to nitrate in these waters because of these processes um because that nitrate isn't coming out of the sediments this is, is the same story um and whether that's having an impact on um adult assemblages potentially but it's yeah. um it is a it is a very different system i think because um you're adding silicon to silicon basically um, right. I've had some people ask, you know, what, why, why am I studying silicon cycling in the Arctic? It's like, well, there's not, there's no silicon. It's much easier to see. <laughs> right. um, um, so that's that's really the problem problem with with studying this in Antarctica. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Okay, do we do we have any more questions? Um, I have one. If nobody else does, um, so. I guess one thing we see in like the North, North Atlantic metal cycling is that some of these like Labrador seawater seems to carry trace metal south. And I don't know if it's coming from the Labrador Sea or if it's kind of being entrained from sedimentary interactions en route. I don't know if you have any thoughts on sources of zinc or iron to those kind of source waters. Um, so we do have trace metal data from the same expeditions and um, the picture that we see basically up that west coast of Greenland is um is that you're you, you are seeing trace metals coming off of melt meltwater. It's um it's pretty clear. You can basically lay it over the oxygen isotopes and you can see um you know enhancements in things like iron and um and I I can't remember about zinc, certainly iron. Um and what we can see also um this is I should say this has nothing to do with me again. This is Amber Annette's work, and she's used um, radium isotopes to look at the actual transport of terrestrial material, uh, terrigenous material, I should say, into the waters. And, you, and those really do show, especially the, 
actually Thor in my tip show even more clearly that you're getting this progressive entrainment of um, um, lithogenic derived material, as shall we say, into the um, into that boundary current, that Western boundary current, which will then move into the into the Labrador Sea. I mean, that stuff's going to be used up pretty quickly. So how far it gets, I don't know, but it's certainly being added. You you mentioned, uh, uh, well, I was thinking, I can't remember if you mentioned, but you, uh, I was thinking of cadmium. Cadmium is a weird an anomaly. There's basically no cadmium in fields, in glacial meltwaters. Um, and it's really weird. It behaves like another thing. It behaves like phosphate, exactly like phosphate. So if you look at the same maps, whereas you'll see enrichments of iron coming off Greenland, you just see high cadmium coming from the Atlantic. It's just, it's in the Atlantic water. So the metals are behaving very differently and cadmium really is doing a beautiful phosphate impression the entire time. That seems to be a pretty global behavior for cadmium. I think it just doesn't seem to interact with sediments very much. It's just, it's just nothing at all. Um, <laughs> And you're right, you are right. Perhaps I shouldn't have been so surprised, but it was just this, yeah. No, I mean, I think in some in some places it is surprising. Mm. I can't quite remember what Matthias, my postdoc, found in Antarctica, but I think there's little influence from the glaciers there on cadmium, just changing the isotopes, but... Okay. Yeah. I mean, in the sort of, in the Labrador seawater, once it's a depth that, like Bermuda, you see no cadmium signal, but you see zinc signals. And I think people have found like plant lignans and things at a thousand meters depth that's presumably being, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, I could talk about that for. <laughs> um, okay, do we have any more questions? Yeah, everybody's keen to get to the bars. <laughs> Okay, if not, if everyone wants to put it, uh, turn their mics on and then we can give a round of applause and say thank you. Uh, Thanks, Kate. Thanks very much, Kate. That was great. Thank you. Thanks very much. It was great to be here. And um, Amy, I'll, I'll email you with those names of diatoms. Apologies. It's Friday evening and I'm completely blank. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. It was great.